that. And so we are recording. And so I welcome everybody to Ease the Spirit of Hope, Ease the Spirit Ministries of Hope. I am Andrea Graham, my husband and I, Reverend James Graham. We are co-founders of Ease of Spirit, and we welcome you to this discussion. We are having a new series, and we're very, very excited about this new series. And so we're going to start with prayer, and then I am going to be reading from this, which is the Daily Inspiration for Better Living. And we are in the month of August. And so I'm going to just mute everybody temporarily. And then I'm going to go into prayer. Just give me one second. And so let's just take a moment. Let's take a moment to still ourselves. And we're going to start by just taking a few deep, refreshing breaths in. And so breathe in, realizing that you're breathing in the essence of God. And relax. And breathe in, knowing that God is. And breathe out. And relax. And one more deep breath in. And relax. And so we just breathed in for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as we invite the Holy Spirit into this discussion. And so, Father, we just begin by recognizing you. And we just recognize you as the one power and presence. You are that everywhere evenly present power of absolute good. And we are so grateful, Father, because you are faithful. We are so grateful, Father, because you do not change. We are so grateful, Father, because we can depend on you. We could depend on you as life, as love, as substance, as wisdom, as power moving in and through us, all around us, sustaining us and sustaining this universe. And as we enter this prayer, Father, we want to just contemplate the attribute of will. And I ask this question and let this question resound in your heart. What is the will? of God. And just think about that. And in order to answer that question, ask the second question. What is the nature of God? Well, we know that the nature of God is absolute good. And Father, we know that you are a fountainhead you are the fountainhead of absolute good and that you flow continuously throughout every fiber of our being, throughout our life and our world and our affairs. And since your nature is absolute good, we know that God's will for us is good. And so as we start this discussion group, Father, we just say thank you. We thank you, Father, as you speak through the facilitator tonight. We thank you, Father, as you speak through each and every person that is here tonight. We thank you, Father, because you bless each person that is here tonight, and you're blessing those that are on their way. We thank you, Father, because we know that you do all things decently and in order, and that is exactly what you're going to do with this discussion. Someone is going to be blessed. Someone is going to be prospered. Someone is going to be healed by the stirring of the Holy Spirit this night. 
And so I release this prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. And so it is. Amen and amen. amen. Hey, and I see Morgan. Hey, Reverend Charles Callahan. We got two Charleses today, so I better be careful. <laughs> hey, Ibedia, how you doing, my friend? I am good. How's everyone today? <laughs> I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to read from page 56 in the Daily Inspiration. And I am so excited about this new series. We are doing the Jesus Trilogy. I know that my husband is totally, totally excited. Hey, Satorius, good to see you. Oh, she's she's got to figure out she doesn't have her sound. She's going to have to figure that out. And she, so welcome, everyone. I welcome Sher Sherry to this first discussion group. Sherry Jackson is in the house, and we welcome her. You're definitely welcome, and we're glad to see you. But we're going to be talking uh, using the Jesus Trilogy, and the discussion is will and choice. And it was not by design that we did this, because in the Universal Foundation for Better Living, we celebrate every month with a, um, a, a spiritual attribute. And the spiritual attribute for the month of August happens to be will. We did not do that. <laughs> that just is how it works out. So on Thursday, August 1st, it is entitled in the Daily Inspiration, Decree God's Will. Decree God's Will. What we decree comes to pass. And we know that the Bible tells us that you decree a thing, it will not return to you void, but it will go out and do the thing that it is established to do. So what we decree comes to pass. As we decree to be and to do the will of God, we are consciously exercising the will as wisdom. This is our path to be happier, healthier, wealthier, spiritual life that we desire. We want to be in the will of God because we know that the will of God for us is absolute good because God cannot will anything that God is not. And since the nature of God is absolute good, then it goes to follow that God's will for us is absolute good. That's why the psalmist can say, the Lord is my shepherd, I cannot, I shall not want. That's why the psalmist says he prepares a table for me and because we know that when God prepares a table, it's filled with absolute good. Our directive power of will determines character individually and as a global family spiritually. So decree now that we prosper without harming ourselves or harming others. We prosper without harming ourselves or others because God is abundance. And it's enough good for everyone in this universe. Really, it should not be any hunger in the world. It's truly enough food to feed everyone. So if we experience lack and limitation, it's because of the consciousness of the individuals that God has given power and dominion over this earth, which is us as human beings. So if it's lack and limitation that we see, it's because of our consciousness. And so we have to come into a conscious agreement right now that there is no lack or limitation because God is abundance. Hey, Dan, how you doing, girl? I'm glad you made it. Hey. hey. Hello, Dan. Hi. Oh. Hi, Dan. <laughs> Hi. Oh, Hi, she is going to Miami. From Miami. <laughs> she is. She is in Miami. Oh. And Teddy Red is here. The spiritual understanding gained by allowing God's will to guide us is the key to the development, expression, and demonstration of our spiritual character. I'm going to say that again. The spiritual understanding that we gain by allowing God's will to guide us is actually the key to the development, expression, 
and demonstration of spiritual character. Because when we let go and let God guide us, we get stronger. We get bolder. We stand on our spiritual feet. We develop spiritual character. If we seriously desire God's good, we will resolutely lay hold of and keep hold on the word of truth until the word becomes who we are. We are spirit created in God's image and likeness, perfect, whole, and complete. We are never sick, hurt, or afraid. And so when we stand firm on the truth of our being, man, don't we build spiritual character. And that's what we're working on doing. We're studying to show ourselves approved. We are like the persistent widow. And I love that persistent widow. Repeating often, act judiciously. Let's practice God's will and watch our demonstration increase. Your will be done, not mine, but your will be done. Do you guys remember that story about that persistent widow? Yeah. Oh my goodness, I love her. She is powerful. You know, that prophet didn't even want to mess with her. He didn't want to have nothing to do with her. And she just kept coming until he, he went on and gave her what she wanted. He said, I'm giving it to you. I think it was a king. He said, I'm giving it to you because I'm tired. I'm tired of you coming here. We got to be persistent. It says knock and the door will be answered. But it doesn't say that you just going to knock once. You may have to persistently knock and knock. Does anybody have anything that they want to say about today's daily inspiration? I thought it was powerful. Any comments about Will? What about when, what about Andrea? This is Yvette but what about when you knock and knock and that door doesn't seem like it's answered, but it is actually answered because it was just not the will. Mm. That's true. I, I can't add anything to that. But they say, they also say that when that door don't open, then, you know, go to the window and open up the window. <laughs> my question to you Ibedia, would be uh, you said and the door doesn't open but how do you know it didn't open maybe it was your state of consciousness that didn't recognize that the door had been flung wide open not you yes. personally but yes. maybe it was a state of consciousness it did not realize that that which you have asked for has already occurred and you just yes. didn't recognize it and therefore, Absolutely. you thought you had to go through a new and a different environment, uh, a, a window or the basement. I mean, you've got a very valid point there. I mean, that makes a lot of sense because that is actually what happens with, you know, sometimes myself. You know, I think that I'm seeing that, that I, you know, I think that to the same appearance is one way, but I actually might have gotten in the way and not actually seeing that the door was open. And it's like, you know, all you got to do is just take that one step through. That's it. That's right. That's right. Gotta... Absolutely. But some hesitant, some moment made you decide to freeze on that. <laughs> and when you don't get immediate relief or, or gratification, we freeze. Yes. And we think that door is not open. It's as bad as talking about um, an animal in a cage. It's been yes. in a cage so long. And then someone comes along and says, I'm going to free this animal. And so they open up the door to the cage. The animal has longed to be free all this time. But even in the sight that there's no cage in front of them, they are still in prison. Yes. And they won't yes. go through that door. So that maybe, habit. That's right. That habit. I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm saying could be. Look no, 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 I'm saying that's the habit, the, the, the habit of, you know, being stuck in one pl familiar place and then just, you know, like not taking that step forward and say, hey, you know what, this door is open. So you just get comfortable with being on one side and not just taking that step forward. Absolutely. And also to, to what degree did that door open? I mean, did it get wide open? Was there just a crack in it 
and, yeah. and someone decided yeah. that the crack wasn't large enough for them to go through. Right. Yes. Yeah. Just saying. And then the thing that I'm actually working on, um, I'm working on a daily inspiration. And um, I've been thinking about that in relationship with the attribute of strength. And so sometimes when the answer does not come, when your answer to your prayer, it doesn't seem to be coming right away, it's because it's some prep work still that you need to work on within yourself so that you are able to, to receive this gift when it comes. So delay does not mean that it's a denial. And so sometimes we have to keep working on ourselves until we are ready to receive the bounty of that blessing that we have been asking for. Sometimes it's a delay because maybe it's a structure somewhere else that needs to be made. It's some groundwork that don't even have anything to do with your consciousness. Maybe the thing that you're asking for requires something to occur first. And maybe someone else is working with their vision and the thing that they're working on is connected to the vision that you have. So there are many, many reasons why sometimes it appears that the door is not open. Right. And we do that with mates. When we're seeking mates and we decide what we want, you know, mm -hmm. but did we never decide what we need to be to get that mate. That's exactly you know, right. That door is open. But have you become that what your mate will be attracted to? That's you know? right. Just, just well, how do you how do you know what you need to work on to accomplish whatever it is? Well, you know, that's who, why we who, pray and we meditate, yeah. Okay. Who was speaking? That was Doris. Oh, Doris, okay. Doris, I see no yeah. You want to um you want to take it in prayer and ask for it to be revealed if you can't figure it out yourself. Okay. And then the answer will come. So I am going to move out of the way because it's gonna be some real serious conversation. This is gonna be so hot. So I will see you guys. I'm gonna take my husband's phone and he will be directing the rest of the discussion. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Reverend Sherry. Hello, everybody. That's not Reverend Sherry. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I didn't know it was. Oh, Reverend wrong Sherry. Sherry. Reverend, <laughs> Reverend Sherry, I think, is um going to a unity church to do some prayer work today. I was with her earlier. Okay. Hey. Well, first thing I want to say is hello to everybody. Hello. 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 Reverend, Hello. Reverend, Reverend Callahan, uh, I am going to drop. I, I I thought I would be out in Twinsburg today where I could drop your book off, but uh, I I I didn't get out there today. So sometime tomorrow I'll just mm -hmm. drop it. If you're not, I'll probably drop it in your mailbox. Just, mm -hmm. you know, okay. I'm reading it on uh, my fire right now. I know, I know so you like okay. to have the hard copy, and I have one for you, so I'll just drop it when I'm out there at work. And Reverend Charles Stevens, uh, it's been a yeah. year in the making. You and I were talking about doing this book over a year ago. Okay. And now finally, <laughs> in God's time, this is what happens. We, yeah. uh, we wanted to do this. Now, this book is not a book that is accepted by UFBL, although it covers a lot of the same material the wording is a little different. They don't use it's it's, it's done in a plain English type of version, and, and, and it's and it's done that way deliberately. So there's no particular religious dogma. However, we are New Thought Christians, and a lot of the things there, I will add in some of the uh, some of the terminology that we use, just because. It's what I believe, and I, I think it's what a, a lot of us believe. Uh, now, one of the things that I, I noticed about this book, this, this book was actually channeled by a lady by the name of Gina Lake. And according to the preface, 
she was able to channel and get this information because she has been in tune with the one we call Jesus the Christ through many lifetimes. A few years ago, I would not have been able to read this book because the minute I read that, I would have been turned off. But now I am a little bit more open-minded to that. And uh, the idea of channeling to me is not so far-fetched because in recent years, as I lay in bed at three and four o'clock in the morning, things have been coming to me and I don't know where they're coming from. Uh, you know, spiritually, they, they come to me uh, and I, I, I won't go into detail into some of them, but one night I was laying in bed and it just came to me that uh, if, if, if all things are energy and if thoughts are energy and energy never dies, then the thoughts that we put out into the ethers remain there forever. Uh -huh. So it is possible for someone to pick up on thoughts that, have, that were put out 2,000 years ago. Yes, yes it's, yes. it's possible for you to pick up the energy vibration of a thought that was put into the ether 40 years ago. And so I don't know about past lives, and I'm not sure about all that, but I believe it is possible for a person to pick up the energy vibrations of a thought that was put out so it might explain how a little small boy can pick up the thoughts of a pilot from World War II and be able to explain everything that pilot was thinking when his plane crashed into the ocean. Because kids, small children, are able, don't have all the stuff in their head that clouds them. They don't have all the disbelief. And they're able to sometimes pick up on things and thoughts that we may not be able to. I'm not saying it's fact, but I'm just saying it, it opened my mind because I had that occurrence as I lay in bed at four in the morning and it woke me up and I I, I woke uh, I had to wait about an hour and I woke my wife up and told her about it. So I my mind is open and I'm capable of, of, of accepting this pretty much at, at a kind of a face value. And uh, this is all about your will and the choices that you make. And it says, we have been given the will, the, the gift of free will, and it requires one thing. And that gift requires consciousness. And what do we mean by consciousness? That is just another word for awareness. And without this awareness, human beings would be no different than animals who function through the primary survival in, uh, instinct and other conditions. Similarly, if we don't use our will and we rely on, on, on uh, condition, our condition reflexes, instincts, just like animals, we are no better than an animal. We are born with certain fundamental condition reflexes, which you, the, the author is calling software. And this is the metaphor he's using. And uh, these, this software determines how we respond to life. And it's designed to optimize our survival. So you have certain things in you that allow you to survive in this physical manifestation, the human body. On the physical plane, you have certain software that was given to you if you will, use the metaphor, or certain conditions that will carry you through and help you to survive. I don't know if you ever noticed, I, uh, if I, I have pets, I like dogs, I, I have dogs, and sometimes you'll tell your dog, lay down, and your dog will start walking around in a circle before it'll lay down. It'll walk around and around and around, then it'll lay down. Well, you know, dogs come from wolves. And wolves live in the plain area, a lot in the plain area, and they hunt in tall grass. And sometimes they'll walk around in a circle to mash the grass down, and they'll lay down in that low spot, and they may go to sleep, and they may lay there for a long time and wait for something to come back. So when you tell your dog to lay down, even though it's not a wolf, that, that software 
and it could be a chihuahua that does it, but this goes all the way back to when all dogs are bred out of, came out of wolves. That is still in your dog. And the dog does not have the ability to change that. Whatever conditioned reflex that dog is born with, it will always operate out of that conditioned reflex. We have the ability to change, and we're, we're going to get into that. Now, this, this uh, software is designed for our survival. It is often called fight or flight instinct, where you're either going to fight or you're going to run. Certain things you do without even thinking about, it's automatic. You have no choice in the matter. It is a survival mechanism. Now, this mechanism includes fear which is useful when you are confronted with a life or death immediate situation, a dangerous situation, fear comes forth, it pumps adrenaline throughout your body, it enhances your ability to react to a situation. However, if you are using your life or death survival instincts to operate in your relationships, this is going to interfere with your ability to have happiness and fulfillment because this 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 uh, software is primitive it's just for survival it's counterproductive in relationships the author says if you rely on this relate this this software in your relationship it can cause you to behave badly react to stress in a negative way and it, it, it might cause you to run out on your responsibilities in a marriage or whatever. You know, I'll tell you what it does to you. When you are relying on this software to guide your life, petty arguments become life or death struggles. You must win at all costs in a petty argument. So you, are, you, know, you and your spouse can get into an argument where you love each other dearly and you actually become disagreeable because you trigger that instinct for survival. You will argue to the death. I've seen good friends get in fights, husbands and wives, and say, what were they fighting about? They were fighting about what channel they were going to watch on TV. I mean, you, you've heard of this where people actually have gone to blows, pulled out weapons, gone, <laughs> gone to all kinds of extremes because they have triggered that primitive aspect of their, of their software. The idea of life or death in a, in a situation that is obviously not life or death. Now, if you're, not, if you're not reacting to an immediate threat, fear has no place in your life. But fear is often used in situations that, that it, it has no place. Now, they call this, the author refers to these reflexes, this primitive part of us, as the ego. Now, according to UFBL, and uh, the revealing word. Andrea, could you uh, take a look at that? Uh, uh, the software he's speaking of refers to ego. So let's take a look at what the revealing word says about ego. Would you look okay. on page 61, and there is ego, and there is reverse ego. I mean, adverse. adverse. Would you please read that for me? Sure. Let me just get to the page. Uh -huh. um, 61. Okay, and so we're talking about, do you want me to read ego or just adverse read ego, ego and adverse ego? Because it's important that we know the difference and how it is looked at from UFBL perspective. Okay, I want, I want to say, first of all, when, when you go to 61 and you talk about ego, yes, it is the eye of you. The eye of you, according to Fillmore. According to Charles Fillmore, of the, who, the founder of Unity, right. the ego is man. And by reason of his divinity, he makes and remakes as he will. In this lie, his greatest strength, but is also his greatest weakness. 
The ego of itself is possessed of nothing. It is a mere ignorant child of innocence and floating in the mind of being. Repeat that one more time. <laughs> the ego of itself is possessed of nothing. It is a mere ignorant child of innocence floating in the mind of being. But through the door of his consciousness must pass all the treasures of God. Now oh, that yes, there yes, 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 yes. Through the door yes. of your consciousness must pass all of the treasures of God. Mm. That's love, life, substance, wisdom, imagination. All of more than what we could even conceive needs to flow through this ego. So you have a, a, an adverse ego and you have a spiritual ego. So now the adverse ego, when the ego attaches itself to sense consciousness, when the ego attaches itself to what it can see, touch, feel, what it experiences through the five senses, it builds what is called the antichrist man who has no basis in reality this is known as the adverse ego it is the adverse ego that causes all the trouble in the world the adverse ego will tell you that it's not enough so i'm gonna take yours the mm. adverse ego will tell you i'm angry and if you're not around here anymore I'm going to just take you out because I'll feel better without you being here. Mm. The adverse ego causes all the trouble in the world. It's selfishness and greed makes men grovel in the mire of materiality when they might soar in the heavens of spirituality. Wow. Okay. Now, now spiritual ego is very short, so I'll say it. Your spiritual ego is your true self. It's an, an individualized center of God consciousness. It is the I am of you. And it is conscious identity. Yes. So for our purposes, when this author is talking about ego, he's talking about the small self or the adverse ego. Are we all together on it? Those of you who have the book and who are just reading this, that's why I went into that. It's a little bit you know, convoluted in a way, but you needed to know that this author is talking about the adverse ego. He's not using UFBL terminology or unity terminology, but he is talking about that part of you that makes it seem like you are a body and you are your mind. It gives you the uh, sense that you are in here inside your body and everything else is out there. The ego makes you feel that you are separate. The ego makes you feel alone and vulnerable to harm from others, and you feel like it's me against the world. That's what the adverse ego, or the ego that he is speaking of in this book. But the question now, the ego, or the pro, and that we, he used the metaphor of uh, software. So you can say the program self is what he talks about on page seven of the book. It creates a sense of self and an identity from the thoughts about yourself. And it's called the false self. So you develop these ideas about yourself, what you are, who you are. It's actually a false identity because it doesn't really exist beyond what you think. If you think you are weak, you become weak. If you think you are unworthy, you become unworthy. Beyond thoughts about yourself. Oh. Yeah. Who is that? I thought someone had said something. I couldn't quite hear it. I, 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 that was me, uh, yes. James. Oh. I just said, oh. <laughs> That's right. So, you know, you develop this idea of yourself, but it's only what you think it is. That is not the truth of you because it is a superficial identity that you're giving yourself 
and is subject to change at all times because you can change your mind about what you are. So it is a James. Yes, Dan. And the ego will tell you, oh, I know they said this, and I know that they're doing this, and uh -huh. I know it's not, you know, it's all the ego. That's right. And it's not the spiritual ego. That's No, no, we're talking about the adverse ego, which yes. is this false sense of self. You know, uh, it, all the, the false self sense is, is thoughts about yourself. It's what you believe. And the description of yourself is always changing to fit new experiences and information. It's like your computer software where it's constantly updating. The information is constantly being updated. <coughs> like there's a computer somewhere taking in this information, processing it, updating the software. And that computer is your brain. It is a computer that stores, processes, and accesses information. And the information that goes in that computer comes from many different sources. Now, in UFBL, we talk about the threefold being of man and the consciousness, the subconsciousness, and the superconsciousness. Okay, that, that's similar to what we're talking about. But in the case of the adverse ego, this information is being taken by past experiences. It's been taken by what you may see in the media. It's taken by what people may say to you. And this information that you have and is stored in your subconscious, that's where that information is actually stored. And this is like a computer. That software is running in the background all the time, feeding you information. When your mama told you you wasn't smart enough, when people say you're not tall enough to play basketball, whatever information you have that's been put into your subconscious, that's been put into that subware, software is going to constantly come up, constantly come up. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know who that was. Oh, you're. Hey, you're, Lisa. That was Lisa. Oh, that was Lisa. Hey. <laughs> All right. I am so. Hello. Hello, Lisa. Hi. Okay. So now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We got a sound effects person. Okay, so now understand, all this stuff that you were told in your past about yourself is stored down in there. And your ego, keep your, your adverse ego, we're just going to use the word ego for tonight, all you true students and UFPL students. We're going to use the word ego tonight. That's why I read that to you and had, had, uh, and had Andre read that to you. Now understand, you're listening to these things running in your background like the software of a computer and this is what you tell yourself it's you you know if you know if you have men who put down women women who put down men this stuff gets stored in your in in your in your uh in your subconscious or like you say i don't know uh, uh, the software of your personal computer now the brain records the information but it doesn't have the wisdom to evaluate the information. And why is that? Because it's only going on its own information. It can only judge based on what's been put in. When you're relying on the, the, the pre-programmed software, your survival software, you only can judge based on what you know. And what you know is what you've experienced or what's been told to you. This is what the adverse ego does. Now, there is something, fortunately, that can supersede that, that type of thinking. And we're going to get into that a little bit later. But we have the ability as human beings, unlike animals, to think about the thoughts that we have and the things that we're with that are going through our mind, these beliefs and all, we have the ability to uh, change our thinking about that. We can override our software. This allows us to evolve, which animals don't have the ability to, to do that type of mental evolvement because they don't have the ability to really 
override their software, only to a degree. I mean, I'll tell you what, you can take a gorilla and bring it in your house, and you can teach it how to sit at the table, like those people did, those chimpanzees, which are so supposed to be so smart and so intelligent. They brought that chimp. I don't know if you ever saw that special on TV about the chimpanzee. These people raised in the house, and they raised it from the time it was an infant, and they treated it like it was one of the kids, and they fed it, and they did this with it. They taught it how to do various things. And that chimpanzee, got, when it got big enough and strong enough, they tried to tear their face off. And it loved them. It, it, knew, it knew how to hand sign and make signals and speak with sign language. And it would say, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know say, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, you know, if you did something that chimpanzee didn't like, it would go chimpanzee on you. Yes. They ended up having to put it in a cage and give it to a zoo. And they were crying and all upset and everything and weeping about this chimpanzee. But you know what? It was a chimpanzee. I mean, you could teach it to act certain ways. You know, I had a buddy used to tell me when we used to hang out, when I used to hang out, he said, you know what you, you if you put a $500 suit on a gorilla, you know what you got? I said, what, man? He said, you got a gorilla in the $500 suit. It don't change the gorilla. <laughs> now he was using that to talk about people in general. But the idea is, when, a, when an animal is pre-programmed, it's only going to change so much. As human beings, we have the ability to override that animal survival software. It allows us to evolve. And through this ability, we become co-creators with a divine. We are able to create. We are able to create. In, in the book on page eight, he says, we are able to co-create with life. That's another word he's using in place of God. And what an amazing gift this is. You get to try your hand at shaping life alongside life itself. There is little in life that is quite as exhilarating and fun as creating. This gives you the ability to make art, tell stories, compose music, write books, produce machines, new products, building institutions, develop technology, and Medicine, it sets you apart from all other existence on this planet. This is called the gift of free will because you can override your software with your free will. The only problem is free will also gives you the ability to destroy. It gives you the ability to destroy your happiness. It gives you the ability to destroy your peace the ability to be hateful, the ability to make war, the ability to be greedy, the ability to damage the environment, and the ability to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. So free will cost comes at a cost, and in order to enjoy its benefits, sometimes you have to pay the cost. Now, from the standpoint of the infinite, which is God, God honors your free will. So you can make choices. It's a gift that he gave you. And no choice is wrong. Understand that. No choice is wrong. However, some choices lead to better outcomes than others. So to say that there is no wrong choice does not mean that there are not paths you shouldn't take. I mean, my, I, my favorite, one of my favorite comedians is Chris Rock. And he says, you know, you can drive a car with your feet if you choose to. That doesn't make it a good idea, but you can do it. You know, you can do a lot of things that you shouldn't do. But there is no wrong choice. It's just some that are best not taken. And sometimes we don't know what is the best way to go until we try and we experiment. Any, any thoughts about the idea of your, your free choice and your free will? Well, I have a, a thought about it, and, and I was just listening to some of the things that you were saying, and so we know that we are threefold beings, and we know that the soul has a structure, and that soul is also threefold, and it is the subconscious, the conscious, as well as the superconscious, and that ability to choose is right within that conscious mind. And so we are able to choose to 
listen to this software, which is the subconscious mind, is feeding lies to us, telling us that we can't do it, that we're not worthy, or we can choose to turn to that part of us, which is always one with the infinite. And we can choose to think thoughts that's aligned to, with the truth of our being, that we are love, we are life, that we are one with God and governed by God's law. And, and it's that ability to choose that actually differentiates us from the gorilla or the chimpanzee that's operating on instinct. Right. Now, here is let me just also add to that about that instinct is we, instead of instinct, deal with intuition when we turn to spirit because we're yeah. not and so and that comes by way of the holy spirit which is able to truly override the software thank you now there's one thing that guides you back when you make these bad choices no matter what choice you make the good thing is even though the outcome may not be what you want it to be, that choice will contribute to your evolution. Because when you make bad choices, you suffer. And suffering ensures that you will change your trajectory away from that which is negative to that which is positive. The trajectory of suffering leads you to love. If your choice if your choice takes you away from love you suffer that suffering will take you back on course and you get to choose of course how long that's going to take you so when you're making these negative choices you are making a choice that does not involve love nine out of ten times it involves ego understand that an ego is that primitive primitive software that leads you away from love. Every choice either celebrates life and furthers creation or shows you the unworthiness, this is on page nine, of that choice, and in so doing, it adds to your understanding. Any thoughts about that? When you make bad choices, you're improving your understanding. So no matter what you do, you're being blessed even though it doesn't seem like a blessing, but sometimes the blessing, as we say, is in the lesson. You just have to realize that there's a blessing behind what you're doing. It don't feel good. It feels bad. Suffering has that purpose. Some choices that lead to suffering always, always teach you something. And you may not realize it at first, but at the very least, it teaches you empathy, sympathy, and compassion. Because once you go through something and you see someone else going through it, you feel bad for them. Oh, my God. I know how that feels. Oh, my God. I, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Oh, you poor guy, whatever, whatever. But suffering teaches you compassion. It says, in, in, yeah, empathy and compassion are only the beginning, however, for they uh, flower into a desire to relieve suffering in others. You know, once you've been through suffering, you don't want to see other people suffer. And that is a form of love. And love is the light that you want to shine on the world. So when you go through suffering, you're learning something. You're learning, and in, in addition to compassion, you want to see other people not have to do that. And so, and you, so you want to, some, oftentimes you want to give service. You see children starving, you want to donate money, so forth and so on. Service is love of others. Love is an identification with another person's own self. Giving to others as you would like to be given naturally flows as a result. Love is one of the sweetest fruits of suffering. The sweetest fruit of suffering to me is love because suffering actually creates love, not boyfriend, girlfriend love. I'm talking about that agape type of love. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and James, if I may say, as you just 
uh, have told us for myself what you were speaking of that suffering mm -hmm. it's devastating <laughs> sure it is <laughs> and it's really something to uh make a decision of you don't want to suffer anymore once you come to the realization of what you're leading up to who we are whose we are and the ability or potential in us to do i'll say the intentions that would promote you to do the best you can with as you move through the process of forgiving uh el eliminating uh the false belief of you know these thoughts with the intention i gotta get back at them i'm not gonna ever fall in love again uh these things happen to me and uh when you start asking these questions and writing them down uh many times you get an answer from just the questions and I have things I have wrote questions down and received the answer through prayer. And right now, if I look at them, I still got books and books here. If I look at them, a different uh, concept is uh, have been permeated in my heart right now. So I see the blessing and the lesson, but some of the feelings and the pain and the hurt has left. Mm. And I think that's when you can move forward with all of this that um i'll say your full potential when you when you find out you no no longer believe this you begin you begin to evolve on. is what that is teddy you start yes. to evolve ever, ever move evolve. toward your yourself yes. Mm -hmm. yes that's what you're doing now I, I you cannot help but become enlightened because love is inescapable yes. if you fail to love you feel the pain of not loving the importance of love Love is so important that you begin to seek it. You want to find love. You learn how to love. Every little act of love helps you to find your way home. What he means by that? You find your way toward God. The more love you exhibit, the closer you start to move toward love. God, if you look in the Bible, everywhere where they say God, you can substitute the word love. For love so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yes. You can use the word love in a place. You cannot help but become enlightened. And you yes. know, while you, you know, love is also another word for light. Light is another word for love. You are spreading the light throughout the world when you spread love. Love, there's nothing but light. There's nothing but love. Sometimes you don't see the light because you don't look at the light. You don't look for the light. You substitute darkness for light. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean the light's not there. It means you got your hands over your eyes refusing to see it. You're refusing to accept the blessings of God because your software is telling you things that are negative. One of the first, the first thing in the Bible is let there be light and light is love let there be love is the first decree the only thing that can obscure the light is acknowledging something instead of the light and this is what your ego does your ego creates situations so that you have a sense of separateness fear and alienation which are byproducts of your software. And the reason it does that is so that the ego can propagate itself. Enlightenment is knowing the truth about who you are and about reality and living that truth. Most human beings are in a prison and there's a prison created by seeing themselves in life as their thoughts describe without realizing their thoughts do not accurately represent reality. So what do we do? We act like puppets. We think we have free will, but we're allowing our ego to guide us. We're not making choices. We're just going by our animal instinct. You know, when I was a little boy, uh, I was having a to-do in high school with somebody. And uh, the, the dude said, yo mama, and I punched him in the nose, bloodied his nose. Went to the principal, you know, principal called my mom and my mom worked during the day, but that day she was home. So guess what? 
she came to school and uh, asked me, why did you do that? I said, well, he was talking about my mama and I wasn't going to have that. So I punched him in the nose. And she said, well, you can't do that in school. I said, well, I couldn't help that. I couldn't help it. Fact is, I did have the choice. I didn't have to punch that guy. But, you know, he just said two words, your mama. And so from that point on, I told my mother, well, I couldn't control that. I have no control over my temper. You know, mama, I got a bad temper. So I have done what? I have described myself as this ill-tempered person, and that carried all the way into my 30s. I believed that I was ill-tempered, and I believed I would punch you in the nose if you said something I didn't like, and I did those things. You know, I was famous for having a bad temper, and I thought it was okay because it was something that I had no control over, and I told myself I had no control over that. And many of us remained in prison, angry, and feeling victimized and blaming others for our pain without realizing that we are our own jailer and our own persecutor. Our minds cause the pain and the ill doing and the suffering that comes as a result of it. This is our own choice that we're making. We're choosing to suffer. And the, the situation maintains the ego's perspective because the ego wants to remain in charge. This means that we have to do some self-examination. And we have a, something that is greater than the will of the ego. And the author calls it on page 13, thy will. That is the will of the higher self, the will of the divine. Thy will. When, and you have to work till you eliminate the will of the ego and only thy will remains. And then the choices you make will lead to much better outcomes. Any thoughts about that before we go to chapter two? Say that again, uh, James Reverend. Okay. It, it's, the object is to eliminate the will of the ego. That ego that is, that will that is grounded in the, the uh, pre-programmed software that is designed for us to survive and only to help us with survival. That survival mechanism should not be what determines how we act all the time. You only use survival mechanism in survival situations. And if once you get that will out of the way, there's something greater waiting to take over. The author calls it thy will. That is divine will. That is the will that comes from the divine. You're able to make that connection with divine and rely on the divine we call in truth the super consciousness to help you with your decision making. Yeah, hey James, so what, I, what I'm taking from this is we're all born, I'm gonna say it, don't take it the way I say it, we are all born as animals. We have instincts to help take care of us when we have not allowed our conscious, we have not nurtured our consciousness to the state of understanding. Uh, it becomes divine will when we separate or start to understand that animal instinct that we had and realize that unlike the animals, we truly have a choice in what we do. And that's when we become the divine will. That is your free will. That right. is your true free will. By when true you are free operating will. out of the, the, the pre-program, that is not your free will. You don't have any choice. When someone Correct. comes up behind you and say, boo, and you jump, you don't have any decision making in that process. That's yeah, your- you really don't. You, you just automatically react. You react. My first reaction is to chop you across the head. Whatever. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. the idea is the extent to which you are happy depends on your exercise of free will. But you got to understand, you exercise your free will, it can lead to happiness, but it can lead to suffering too. So explain that where, at what point do we get to divine will as opposed to uh -huh. will. We're going to get to that. Oh, okay. As we go through the book. I, I was too early. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, we have chapters to deal with that. Yeah. I, I always kind of start and preface the uh, preface of the, the uh, discussion with, with these things that deal with the earthly and so forth. And then my wife and uh, other people like Teddy's going to come in with, uh, and other presenters are going to come in and kind of put it from a different perspective. 
So, so Reverend James. Yes. Go ahead, Morgan. Is there ever a time? I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this question out there. Sure. Is there ever a time when the eagle serves a good positive purpose? Yes, there oh, is. Yes, yes. Of course yes, there is. Yes, yes. There is a time when the ego can serve a positive Absolutely. purpose. That's why UFBL separates ego from adverse ego. There is a part of you that can also be called ego that is the I am of you. Yes. So I'm not going to go into any more depth than that because I think you already knows, know what that means. Yes. Mm -hmm. You see, that part of you, uh, which is tied to the divine, is also ego, but it is not the adverse ego that we're discussing right now in this chapter. Mm -hmm. So you want something uh, that would help, I'll say, myself <coughs> to um, not, well, make the adverse ego understand i'm getting ready to make a change which i had to do and i talked to it quite a bit and prayed with it and introduced myself to the ego within me when when i had many many things going on in my life and i remember someone at the ltc asked well, Teddy, why are you always talking about the ego? I said, because I found out that was really my challenge. That ego that I totally wasn't aware of, trying to figure out, well, where is, you know, just doing my self thing, that, that self thing, not mm -hmm. considering anything but what it was saying. You know, uh, don't let them people intimidate you. Don't start, mm -hmm. you know, go get them because they don't hurt your feelings, you know, that kind of thing. And I found out as I started, uh, moving through some light that that wasn't the uh <laughs> the real me <laughs> okay mm -hmm. okay so i'm saying with that change in my mind this is what i had to work with for such a long time and finally i think i've got to that point that it understands me and i understand it very much and we are working together beautiful now thank you uh when people do that question your thinking, when you do not examine what you're thinking about, mm -hmm. and that's the case with most people, you go through life without even realizing, you, you start to have reactions that lead to you doing something like when someone gets angry, you get angry back. This is, a, this is an understandable reaction since anger is part of the fight or flight programming therefore an automatic response in what seems to be a threat. If you get angry often enough, that response starts to feel normal. That yeah. becomes yeah. your norm. Yeah. And the more it becomes natural. It starts to feel like what you should be doing. But anger doesn't feel good. No. Nope. You're actually suffering. You're feeling bad because you're doing what you think is normal, what you're supposed to do. And if certain behaviors are repeating often enough, they become addictive. Yes. The feeling of being compelled to act a certain way and having no choice about it is how the unexamined <laughs> life feels. People feel compelled to respond a certain way. Life is very difficult for those who do not examine their thoughts. They experience so much suffering and they have no way out because they don't realize they're the one creating their own <laughs> They're trusting their thoughts that they shouldn't trust. You're believing in what you think. You're believing that this is the way it should be because these are the thoughts that are going through my head and you are not examining those thoughts. And the real of the real is if you don't feel good, if you are suffering, you need to examine what you're thinking about. Yes. You need to change. Yes, go ahead, Javadia. Robert James. You know what? This is this is ironic that this conversation is taking place. Uh, my, if if I may, my higher self. Yet, you know, when I got off work what, yesterday morning or the day before, and I was having a conversation with someone that I was helping, trying to help through, you know, reading the twelve, uh, the, the um, twelve steps to healing to them and things of that nature, and. You know, I kept noticing that every time I talked to this individual, they seemed to be in this flight of 
fight or flight mode. And mm-hmm. then I, I, I just, I don't know, it just came up on, I, I, uh, you know, something I was able just to decipher. And I'm like, I think you find it. I think I told this person, I said, I think you're finding yourself and you need to pay attention that you're in this fight or flight mode all the time. And what you're doing is creating this within your own self, this huge level of, of defense. And anytime anybody pretty much says anything to you, mm-hmm. and you feel like you have to respond in a defensive mode. And what you're also doing, which I can tell you what you're doing to me when I have a conversation with you, I can feel your tension and that transfer oh, yeah. of emotion is causing uh, me not to feel good to not want to even talk to you. So you need to check yourself. And it's just, I just think that this, like this conversation being, I, I, you know, that has taken place. Now I can relate that the, the ego part of what they need to deal with, or just, you know, to bring, to, to, to add to what is uh, taking place. This is kind of, this is very profound for me. It just touches a, a, a area that I, before this, before having this conversation, right in this moment, it's like, okay, I didn't even know. But this, this centers back around to this experience that I'm just having with this individual about a day or two ago. Mm-hmm. So thank and you know what? That person is stealing your joy. That person exactly. is stealing your joy. You exactly. know, you cannot allow them to, to spiral you down from yep. your state of joy down to, to anger, to whatever, you know, that vibrational chart that we work off of. Exactly. Right? Okay. Yeah. Now, in a way, Ivania, can I can I chime in for a second? Ivania, one of the things you may have to understand about this person is that I would tell you point blank. Where I grew up, I was the thinnest person around. I don't like to be racist. I was the lightest person around. I was the shortest person around. I was taught that if anybody got in your face, you had to fight them. That's right. Me okay. too. <laughs> now, what occurs when you get that mentality about you is you think you have to fight everything. Yeah. You, yes. you haven't learned to love. You haven't learned to discern the difference between someone is out to get you and someone right. is actually trying to help you. Right. So what you, yep. you may have to do with that person is you may just have to pray enough for you to have more understanding about the situation that they are going through or have gone through. We know we can't change other people. Only the people who desire a change will will see that change. But, you know, but that's the way it is in life. I was that way for many years until I realized I had to accept me for who I am and right. not be concerned about what other people that's right. are doing. You know? now, in, now, in a way, in a way, those who are so deeply in the grip of their conditioning are not responsible for what they do. They have given control of their choices to the primitive part of their life, or their ego. Yes. So forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. They do. Amen. Sometimes to, something needs to happen to break us out of this automatic and dysfunctional program response. The will to choose differently needs to be awakened, but how does that come about? Is there a way out of suffering? At some point, the question dawns, and if pursued, it eventually leads you to freedom. In other words, Reverend Bowen used to say, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, that's when you start to make the move. When going along with the ego choices turns out badly, as it often does, people begin to see through the illusion. Thoughts are not always true and wise. The eye that is represented by the thoughts are not so smart. The thoughts that run through your mind were never intended to run the show. You understand that? The ego thoughts, they're not supposed to be running your show. You are not supposed to be led by the default (laughs) software that is meant only for your survival. But it destroys you when you do it that way. You know, the ego will then turn around and try to tell you, well, listen to me. Listen to me. I know what you need. What you need is more money. What you need is a new hairdo. What you need is a better house. What you need is a better car. Listen to me. That's what your ego tells you. 
It, ca it comes up with these things and it sets goals that no matter what goal you reach, there's always another goal because the ego leads you away from love. It leads you to self-satisfaction. And it makes you obsessed with yourself. Now, you may think that you are doing some examination of your thoughts, but the fact of the matter is, you're only examining what you already think. There's no new information. You can only examine garbage in, garbage out. Most people do not want to be who their thoughts describe them to be. Many people believe that one way to be more like what they want to be is to have more positive thoughts. So they try to redesign their thoughts and self-image to reflect what they think they would like to be. But according to who? For the most part, people want to be smarter, more attractive, richer, more successful, more competent, but those things put put them because those things will put them on top of the heat ahead of the game. But it is only the ego that wants to be and seen this way. This is just the ego doing its own self improvement. It's just telling itself that if I do these things, I'll be able to get what I want. What is rarely appreciated is that even after achieving these things, you still can suffer. Just because you achieve those things don't mean you're going to be any better off. Uh, we have a president who has achieved a lot. And you know what? He is a symbol of the idea of the ego. He makes no bones about his ego because he's trying to, really that man is looking for love, believe it or not. And we should pray for him because he is looking for love in all the wrong places. He's achieved a, enough wealth and enough power that, that any 10 of us would be happy to have. But he still is not. He still is putting people down. He's doing all kind of nasty, disgusting things because it's his ego that is leading him, not his higher self. And I'm not so, saying that um, not badly about him. I'm just saying this is just my analysis. Can I break in with a few questions? Yes, yes, Mrs. Graham. So I'm listening. You're saying that um, I could want the big fancy car and the big pretty house and the perfect spouse and the, the prestigious job. I can get all those things and I'm still not happy. That's so, right. and, uh, and, and new thought is a prosperity teaching. We yes. often ask for these things and I'm opening this up to the floor, mm -hmm. to the participants. Thank you first the kingdom of God. Right. Well, I'm, I'm opening this up to the participants. Yeah. Why prosperity. is it, Go ahead. why is it that in light of getting all these things that we're making these affirmations for and we're doing treasure mapping and journaling why is it that we can get these things and still not stop the suffering all those maps and all, all that treasure mapping is nothing more than a picture of, of your conscious awareness of, of a higher state of being in contact with God. I mean, think about a child. A child wants every piece of candy, all different types of candy, every toy they can have. But that child is not really looking for that toy. They're looking for an instrument that can make them feel better about themselves, something that will give them joy. So see, in these houses and all this money, we're not really looking for that house and that car and, and, or that great mate. We're actually looking to be happy, to, to realize our true state of being with God. I mean, per se. 
we don't even know that that's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. But because of who we were born as, that is what we were looking for. We were looking Amen. for a closer relationship with that from whence we came. So uh, just treasure mapping for that bigger house. All you're saying is, I want to see more prosperity in my life. But, but as James said earlier, you can be a multi-billionaire and be the most unhappy person in the world. You, when you are that type of person, all you're do doing is looking for more and more and more. But more of what? They haven't discovered yet what they're really looking for more of. So once they decide what they're really looking for more of, they'll be happier. Uh, as you say, James said he prays for the merry night. I do too. I pray for their uh, uh, consciousness to be unfolded into an understanding of who they're supposed to be serving. They're supposed to be serving God first. But they also, second, should be serving the people that, that they were put in power to observe. You well, know? You know, and it's also this, Charles, no matter what you do, you are drawn to love. Absolutely. You want it. You don't have love in your heart. If you are not expressing love, you are not expressing God. God is love. And we are here to express mm -hmm. God. If you are not doing that, you're not fulfilling your purpose. And all the other things you do are superfluous, immaterial, and irrelevant. You understand? You can get all the money in the world, all the cars in the world. You can get all kind of relationships, do all kind of things. But when you are not serving God and you are not demonstrating love, right. you feel empty. Right. And, you and if I, that. Yes, go ahead. If I could just um, bring us back, since we've been talking so much about suffering mm -hmm. and, and just bring to awareness what we've been taught is that the primary cause of suffering is our forgetfulness of our own spiritual nature. Thank you. We don't know who and what we are. We don't realize that we are spiritual beings in a spiritual universe, and we're governed by spiritual laws. And I so think, that's the primary cause of our suffering. I think Andre was looking at my notes here. <laughs> I'm sorry. The secondary cause of our suffering is the fact that we we uh have wrong thinking it causes us to believe that we are separate from god exactly and separate from each other and that's and what the ego does we have the other cause of suffering which is our unwillingness to change right so when yes. we come into yes. the realization of who's and who we are the suffering ends it is not necessary for us to suffer uh, it is uh, not necessary for us to suffer because when we know who we are, tender compassion, which is a byproduct of love, will naturally flow from us. Now, it is possible for us to have a life without suffering. Now, how is it possible? It is only possible through a transformation of the relationship with your thought. What does scripture say about that? Be ye transformed by the renewing of your renewing. mind. By the renewing of your mind. Thank you very much, students. Okay, this transformation is happening every day to many people. And if it hasn't happened to you already, guess what? It's happening right now as a result of taking this class. There is a greater will that you must yield to, and it is called thy will by the author of this book or divine will uh so we're going to get it it's it's uh 12 9, 8 19 and i'm going to stop here if there are any questions or comments anybody wanted we got the last 10 minutes we can kind of i'm going to kind of open up the floor to anybody who had any thought and lisa i want you to know when, when i tell you about do not let anyone steal your joy that's what this is about right here. Satoria, go ahead and say what you're going to say. Well, I thought you Am I on now? Huh? Am I on now? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, oh, I am enjoying this so much. Oh, God, wow. I wish I could see you. <laughs> uh, no, not, not yet. Okay. Not yet. There's Andrea looking at me. Don't yeah, yeah, we're all looking at you. <laughs> That's Satori and Lindsay, for those of you who do not know. 
really an iconic teacher from our church. Okay, here's what I wanted to to go back to, and and this was what you started talking about. Uh, it was someone asked the question about when we don't get our prayers answered. Mm. You remember from the very yes, beginning. Yes. And there's a there's a little um, I guess a saying that makes that pretty simple. I think God says to us, uh, either we go, meaning whatever that prayer is that you want answered, you he'll say go, that means yes, of course. Okay, and the other one is go go slow. Next one is slow. And then no. What does that mean? It means that that is whatever it is that you're praying about is not for you. And grow would be, you got to learn some other things before you can get whatever it is you're asking for. And I think many of you said that in so many words, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's go, slow, know, and grow. Oh, wow. It, Thank it, you. It's pretty simple, and whenever you look at that or think about that, you know already there's probably something that I've got to do. I need to work on mm -hmm. something more. Mm -hmm. I need to change mm -hmm. my consciousness mm -hmm. at this time in order to get that that I want. I didn't know all y'all could see me. This is awful. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see you. You're I can't see you. Either, we we can't see you. We can't Victoria. see you. You got your camera turned off. Yeah, you got your camera turned off. I wish you we turned it off because we all want to see you. We miss you and we love you. We love to see you. I don't want you to see me now. <laughs> all right. This is not the day. Yeah, all right. <laughs> you know, we are looking forward to seeing you, ain't we, child? <laughs> Yes, you know we are. We miss you, lady. Okay, I'll be online. I'm loving this. Oh, thank you so much for being online with us. Reverend May, our spiritual mother, is not here tonight. She's traveling, and I, I want to uh, pray for her to have traveling mercy. Uh, we love you, Reverend May, wherever you may be. We thank you and bless you for all you do in support of this ministry. I bless and thank each and every one of you who come. I bless and thank each and every one of you who come to our uh, uh, events on, on the last Saturday of each month. And I bless and thank each one of you who participate in these discussions. And don't be shy about speaking because you may say the one thing that somebody in this discussion needs to hear. It's not just about me, it's not just about Andrea, or either one of the Reverend Charleses, or whoever. You never know who needs to hear. This is a spiritual discussion. We have people who facilitate the discussion, but we do love and enjoy everyone speaking what they feel, because if what you're feeling is important to each and every one of us. So now, it is time. We got seven minutes left. Is there any other comments before we pray out? Good class, Reverend Graham. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Miss Teddy. Don't be speeding this class. Oh, I think you got seven minutes. <laughs> well, go ahead if you got something to say. We 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 love to hear it. <laughs> I just want to say that um, we have the fellowships coming up. They come really, really fast. Morgan, <coughs> you and I have to get together because you're supposed to be doing a good bit piece of that uh, fellowship. And you never told me what your topic was going to be so that I could start wrapping things around what you're doing. So that's one thing. Reverend Charles, Callahan is going to be um, presenting in September. And I am so excited to see the men take center stage. That's going to be excellent. And so yes. um, I'm really, really looking forward to that. So um, that's all I had to say. <laughs> Anybody else? Sherry, this is your first time being here. You can unmute yourself if you have any thoughts or anything you wanted to say before we pray out. Yeah. And what day is that fellowship before Sherry uh, chimes in? What day is that fellowship? Is that, that, uh, I think it's uh, uh, the 31st. Yours, one is August 31st. The one okay, I won't be here. I won't be here August 31st. I'll be in New York. 
That's okay. what I wanted to make for if it wasn't going to be the last. That's the last Saturday in uh, yeah. August. Yeah. That's yeah. the very last one. And I'm yeah, going to ask about Reverend Dunnigan and, and Lisa. I got to get with them and get the yeah, Reverend Dunnigan is supposed to be presenting in October. And so um, uh, the, the one that Reverend Charles Callahan is going to be doing is going to be um, September 28th. Was that Charles Stevens I heard in the background? Uh, yes, you did. Yeah, go ahead, Charles. Oh, uh, I mean, I didn't have a con uh, The only well, comment I, thought I you had, uh, uh, as in going forward, uh, again, in speaking uh, the kingdom of, uh, of, of, of heaven first, that's where uh, the, we, everything begins, which with, with seeking that consciousness first, and as uh, and and I think it's it's for us uh, that God wants us to rule this earth as He rules in heaven. So it's about bringing bringing heaven here on earth. Right. So that's that's that that's our 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 our, our mission is, is is to do that. So. Uh, as as we grow in that understanding of what then we are supposed to do to bring that 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 uh, our heavenly gifts here on earth, so we can live like kings and queens here on earth. Yes, that's our you know that's that that's that's the great commission that 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 Jesus had is to restore us back to this kingdom here on earth. So. That's and, my, that's my you, only comment. You know, Reverend Charles, just, had, just adding on to that, Jesus had two commandments that he said, on which, on, on which all the laws and commandments, love thy God with all thy heart and love thy neighbor as thyself. You, did you notice it's all about love? Cherry, were you looking to come in? If not, I don't want to put you on the spot. I know it's your first time here. And uh, I'm going to ask the Reverend Charles Stevens if he would pray us out. <laughs> no, thank you. What a cherry. Go ahead. Cherry, go Not ahead. Wrong. No, thank you. Huh? You you you're okay? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Any questions or anything that came up in that, that that There were none. No. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you for being here and lending your consciousness. We thank you for being here. We really do. And Reverend Charles, if you would pray us out at this time, we can close out. All right. Uh, as we just send ourselves, uh, we give thanks. We say, Father, Mother, God, we are grateful and thankful for, again, another uh, awakening as we continue to work with uh, unfolding ourselves uh, as we take in information and discuss this information. We're grateful and thankful for our facilitators, the, uh, the Grams, the Reverend Grams, that they continue to to work as as you will them to work, as you reveal to them the ideas and things that are to be shared in this discussion group. Uh, Father, we are grateful and thankful for each and every soul that is online today, uh, that their consciousness is open and receptive to uh, new ideas, open and receptive, so that they are uh, willing to make changes in their life by the choices that they choose. Yes, uh, they they are the ones that are making, uh, uh, creating the world that is around them. So, Father, we just ask for a great understanding of what it is that we are to share with this world, uh, and we release this prayer in the name, nation power that's in Jesus Christ, that it is so, and so it is. Amen and amen. 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 Uh, Reverend Morgan Alexander will be in a play soon, and when, when that is uh, on, please let us know so we can come and support you. I, we, we went to see her last play. She was excellent. I thought she was the star of the show. Uh, I swear I would love that, but very nice um, supporter. It's not I until will. September. Well, that's okay. Right. We'll come to see Whenever you. Whenever it is. I'd love for a bunch of us to get together. We should all get together and um, go and mass. Her, go to dinner and just kind of make events surrounding 
that that just would be wonderful. That's what we should do. Okay. I, I thank everyone for your consciousness and being here and have a wonderful night. May God bless you all. Bless you. Love and blessings. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Good night. I didn't turn off the uh, the recording. I want you to do those people should not be able to record it off It should be a lot of discussion with that. Yeah, the one should have a lot of discussion.